Good day again, this is Professor Resnick, and today I want to uh, introduce you to the class theory of Marx, since we have now covered the uh, logic of a Marxian theory, the dialectic, or what I have been calling overdetermination. And I've al already, in the first uh, couple lectures, introduced you to the overall idea of Marx, this uh, class theory. I, we want to today present the, uh, or begin to present the details of this class idea. Marx is, as I've told you, Marx's entry point, uh, the way he begins to organize um, his understanding of society, is from the perspective of, of class. And what he means by class is the organization of surplus. So that's the first idea um, in the thought concrete that he's going to uh, construct of society. He argues that human beings, lab human beings labor uh, to produce wealth. That's not an original idea that human beings uh, labor to produce wealth to sustain themselves. Um, Adam Smith had that idea, Ricardo and others as well. What Marx, however, adds to this is something entirely new in social theory. In other words, he inaugurates a whole new idea. He breaks that labor process into two parts. The first part he calls necessary labor. That is the quantum of labor required to produce goods and services, consumer goods, to sustain the laborer. Notice there's two parts here. The quantum of labor to produce the consumer goods, and the second part, to sustain the laborers. We're going to come back to that throughout the course. But in any case, the first uh, idea here is it breaking up the labor process into necessary labor. Any labor above and beyond necessary is what he calls surplus labor. So he begins to then ask questions, once he's done this, ask questions about this necessary and surplus labor. First question you can ask is, who produces necessary and who produces the, the, the surplus? Who gets the surplus that's being produced by those individuals who produce the necessary and uh, surplus labor? What do they do, the people who get the surplus, what do they do with the surplus that they acquire? And are there individuals in society who get shares of this surplus, even though they didn't initially get it? And why do they get a share of the surplus from the individuals who initially receive it. So we can ask all kinds of, of questions about this organization of surplus once he divides this labor process into these two parts of necessary and surplus. Class literally classifies a population into those who uh, perform and appropriate or receive this uh, surplus. So. Let me, let me, since this is so important, since this is the entry point, let me put this on the, on the blackboard, okay, this, this first idea, this thesis of Marx. So he's arguing here that people do necessary labor. Once again, the labor that is required to produce the goods and services to sustain the laborers, plus they do a surplus labor, and then the total would be the labor that they perform. Okay? That's what the new idea of Marx is, this organization of surplus. This idea that you can classify a population into those who perform necessary in surplus and those who receive the surplus without performing necessary in surplus. By the way, it's quite possible in a society to have individuals both perform necessary in surplus and receive the surplus. And it's also possible to have a society or societies in which people perform the necessary in surplus, but they don't get the surplus. This is the labor process divided into these two aspects, these two parts. Okay? The necessary labor times a productivity would be the consumption to sustain those laborers. So they perform, let's say, four days times the wealth produced 
by those four days. So we can put up here the little a is the wealth per unit necessary labor. And then that would be the consumption wealth to sustain the laborers. But they don't stop. Marx is arguing people labor above and beyond the necessary, and they do a surplus labor times the, I'm going to make the same A, productivity. And so they produce this surplus wealth above and beyond their consumption. And of course, the total then would be the wealth produced in a society. Okay? Then the question is, This part, this aspect emanating from the necessary labor times its productivity, that sustains the laborers, the goods and services to sustain the people who are doing the necessary and surplus. Then the question is, who gets this extra wealth, surplus? Who gets the extra wealth? Is it the same individuals that are producing it, or is it a different set of individuals? In capitalism, where, he spends, where Marx spends most of his time analyzing, the workers who produce this totality only get this amount, the capitalists get this amount. In communism, to make the striking contrast to capitalism, the workers produce this amount, as they do in capitalism, but in communism, the workers as a collectivity not only produce it, they get it. Okay? So there's the direct contrast between capitalism and communism in terms of this organization of surplus. I'm going to come back to that, but let me continue. Why would anybody produce surplus? I mean, once you introduce this, you gotta, it, it, the logic is you've got to ask the question, why would anybody produce, produce an extra above and beyond what is necessary to sustain those laborers? And Marx then theorize, theorizes, and this is in volumes two and three of his great work, Capital, that the surplus is necessary for a society to, to exist. Why? Well, this extra wealth, this surplus above and beyond necessary, provides the wherewithal for, uh, what kind of expression can I use, for, for a social glue to exist in society, to hold the society together. Because this is going to support those individuals in society who provide the conditions of existence, remember that, that, that language that we use, that provide the conditions of existence, the non-class processes, which will enable this organization of surplus to exist and be reproduced over time. So there will be individuals in society, other than these individuals who are doing necessary and surplus, who will do a different kind of labor. Very important labor, but it's just a different kind of labor than these. That labor will produce political, economic, cultural processes, which will enable this kind of cl class process that I just described to you to exist and to be reproduced over time. So those, those other individuals, are, you might call them initially enablers. They are producing a set of non-class processes which enable the class process to exist and be reproduced over time. For example, some individual society may be producing religious ideas, political ideas. They may be producing uh, tools and equipment and so forth. So, those various non-class processes, why non-class? Because they're not directly, they're not involved directly with the production um, and appropriation of surplus. So they produce the, the, the culture of religion, the, the politics of the laws, and, and the economics of investment goods and so forth, which enable this class structure, once again, to exist and uh, be reproduced over time. So each and every society needs a surplus to support the laboring of those individuals who provide, again, the conditions of existence of that surplus. Well, the next step then would have to be that this surplus here, that has to be distributed okay, to support all these political, economic, and cultural, these non-class processes enabling the, the surplus to exist in the first place. Okay? Now, in your reading, the organization, this, this surplus, this production of surplus, and this, this is, you know, once again, after consumption, this production of the surplus and this um, appropriation of the surplus is called the fundamental class process in your reading. 
the distribution of the surplus is called the subsumed class process. Okay? And the individuals who get the surplus, called the fundamental class processes, I'm sorry, let's, let me do that again. The individuals who appropriate the surplus, called the fundamental classes, then have to take that surplus and distribute it, that's called the subsumed class process. To all those other individuals, they are called subsumed classes, who provide the conditions of existence of that fundamental class process. Let me put that on the blackboard, since that's a lot of words. Erase this. We have a surplus. Okay. So this refers to the fundamental class process. A single process in which individuals, once again, do necessary labor. The yield of that is their consumption. They do labor above that surplus. That surplus is received, let's say, by, by another group. Then that surplus has to be distributed. That's the subsumed class process. That's the distribution of it. To support, I'll use a Greek letter. That's a sigma. To support all of the expenditures, the subsumed class payments, to whom? To the subsumed classes who provide the conditions of existence of this. So over here on the right-hand side, we have these individuals securing, let's call them non-class processes. So they get a cut of the surplus to help support them. They produce and disseminate non-class processes, politics, culture, economics, that is economics other than class, which provide the conditions of existence of the left-hand side. That's the logic of overdetermination. But of course, the left-hand side also supplies the condition of existence of the right-hand side. In other words, each side of the equation is both cause and effect. Each overdetermines the other. We're deploying then our, the logic we learned about the dialectic or overdetermination to understand this class theory of society. Okay? Let me give you an example of this. Okay? <clears throat> Let me start with, with capitalism, our society in the United States today. So I'm going to use this I'm going to use this uh, theory we just uh, presented, this just overview to talk about then uh, capitalism. Consider the, the uh, uh, corporations in the United States, industrial corporations. Marx is claiming that the workers in, working in those corporations, they produce a, a surplus, it's called gross profit, and the surplus is received by a board of directors. Why? Well, the board of directors, literally, we're talking 20, 22 people, the board of directors in that corporation, General Electric, they personify the corporation. Under the law, the corporation is a, is a person, and the person is personified in its board of directors. And then, po th th then politically and culturally and economically, that small set of individuals receives the profit of the uh, 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 corporation, that is the surplus that the workers have produced.